I'm Eric Anderson. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, remembering the victims of the San Bernardino shooting, the evidence that prompted federal officials to treat it as a terrorism case. And clearing out the muck and bracing for El Nino, San Diego leaders prepare for stormy weather and flooding. We'll see how a state of emergency sparked an environmental debate. Also, a tuna, can, a tuna deal canned the San Diego company, forced to rethink plans to expand. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. The FBI says it is now investigating the attacks in San Bernardino as an act of terrorism. That comes after days of questions about those attacks. Authorities say Saeed Farouk and Tashfin Malik carried out the bloody attack at the Inland Regional Center on Wednesday, killing 14 people. The couple died following a gun battle with police. Today, investigators say the shooters tried to get rid of emails and digital evidence inside their home. Agents also found two cell phones deliberately destroyed. Investigators say the married couple were not operating as part of a terrorist cell or part of a network. This is now a federal terrorism investigation led by the FBI. And the reason for that is that the investigation so far has developed indications of radicalization by the killers and of a potential uh, inspiration by foreign terrorist organizations. And uh, we are spending a tremendous amount of time, as you might imagine, over the last 48 hours trying to understand the motives of these killers and trying to understand every detail of their lives. A candlelight vigil was held at a ballpark last night. The stadium lights were dimmed when the names of the victims were read. San Diego's Muslim community is speaking out today against those terrorist attacks in uh, San Bernardino. <laughs> Members of the Muslim Leadership Council of San Diego gathered at a local mosque. Adel Jalal Masgari says local Muslims are standing together to denounce unjustifiable acts of violence in San Bernardino. So we condemn what happened in the strongest form without any reservation, and we believe what happens is an act of insanity and cowardness and has nothing to do with anything else. The shooting is a topic of many discussions, both formal sermons and informal talks before and after prayer. Leadership Council President says there is both concern and fear, but local leaders are united. Whoever perpetrates it, it's, it's just a, a serious injustice to the human family, and uh, that deeply disturbs us, and we want to make that known to the community. A San Diego police cruiser was parked outside the mosque where the leaders gathered. The council members say they are working with city officials to make sure none of the religious gathering spots become focal points for violence. People at the mosque say there is particular concern about Muslim sisters because their religious clothing sets them apart from the crowd. They say some are choosing to remain inside to avoid becoming targets. California gun stores are seeing a spike in firearm and ammunition sales, which may be a response to the mass shooting in San Bernardino. The day after the shooting, reports show a sharp increase in gun and ammunition sales at firearm stores nearby. Gun expert, experts say that firearm owners are concerned about their safety. The county building where the shooting occurred was a gun-free zone under state law. The gun control debate was also on center stage on Capitol Hill. The Senate has voted against expanding background checks for more gun purchases, rejecting the proposal a day after the shooting in San Bernardino. And the debate over gun safety is also starting up in San Diego. Don works for a private security contractor. His business involves and requires the use of firearms. To well, firearms? I think certainly... Um Individuals that have known and uh, quantifiable psychiatric conditions should definitely be put into some kind of database so that you know law enforcement and, and uh, firearms can not get into the hands of people that are non-stable. Um, I think that some of the reforms in regards to accountability for firearm owners, uh, some training certainly helps. I think we run into a problem where people are got, you know, basically purchasing firearms and they may not have adequate training. You know, good training goes a long way, and that's one of the things that, that Aegis does also, is they do provide training to get people more intellectually 
aware and, and truly responsible skill set. I mean, anybody behind a car without any kind of training is lethal. KPBS coverage of the shooting investigation continues on KPBS radio and online at kpbs.org. San Diego police promised to ramp up security measures at Balboa Park during the annual December Nights celebration. This after the mass shooting at San Bernardino this week. Police say there will be more officers keeping an eye on events today and tomorrow at the park. But I think our best defense and the best thing we can do is still get out here, enjoy our freedoms, enjoy the things we love, hug our families and get out here and have a great time. More than 350,000 people are expected to attend the Balboa Park celebrations this weekend. KPBS culture reporter Angela Carone is at the park where the festivities are already underway. Angela? That's right, Eric. It definitely feels like the holidays here in Balboa Park. The lights are up, there are choral groups singing Christmas carols, and they're about to do an official tree lighting ceremony right here at the Oregon Pavilion. Now, earlier today, we spoke with Tomas Herrera Mishler. He's the head of the Balboa Park Conservancy, and he says there's a reason why they're expecting over 350,000 visitors to the park this weekend. Year after year. Well, it's really quite a magical place, isn't it? We've got the beautiful historic architecture, and then it's lit up so beautifully at night. It's it's really sheer magic. And then you combine 65 different food vendors, food from all over the world, wonderful live music on five different stages, and the price is right. right? It's free, so uh, it's very appealing to people of all ages. And, you know, the whole event is free, but also all of the museums are offering free admission from 5 to 9, both tonight and tomorrow night. Also, save yourself a headache, take public transportation, or use one of the free shuttle services. Angela Carone, KPBS News. San Diego-based Bumblebee Seafood and Chicken of the Sea have called off their proposed merger. Now, this after the Obama administration said it would hurt competition in the canned tuna market. Both companies announced the plan a year ago. The Justice Department canned the deal, saying that Chicken of the Sea and Bumblebee would have combined the second and third largest sellers of packaged tuna in the United States. The California School Board Association's annual conference welcomed more than 3,000 educators to the San Diego Convention Center today. They're thinking about ways to improve schools. The teacher shortage is one challenge that conference goers are desperate to solve. California Teachers Association says the state is dead last when it comes to teacher to student ratios. Mike Walsh from the California School Board Association says hiring more teachers is all about treating students fairly. The teacher shortage is an interesting conversation for us because it seems to center around um, one of our bigger concerns around equity. The teacher shortage is already hitting home for millions of California's children. The National Alzheimer's Association has lost its San Diego affiliate, but as Amitha Sharma finds out, the move may actually boost services for people with Alzheimer's. The local chapter of the Alzheimer's Association is breaking away from the national organization. The separation follows the National Association's decision to consolidate its affiliates into a single nonprofit. Joining me to talk about the decision to break away is Mary Ball, president and CEO of the newly created group Alzheimer's San Diego. Mary, why break away from the National Association and how controversial a decision was this? Well, it was certainly a difficult decision for our board of directors to make, but when you look at how do we best serve this community, having a local board and having 100% of donations stay here in San Diego to help people here in San Diego and to support local research, that's the best way to go for us. So what was the National Association proposing under consolidation vis-a-vis -vis donations? Well, all of the donations under the consolidation model would be sent to Chicago. So 100% of money raised would be sent to the Chicago headquarters, and then it was yet to be determined how much money would come back to local areas. So obviously that didn't sit well with the San Diego chapter. What about other chapters of the Alzheimer's Association? Well, when the consolidation was brought up by the national organization, half of the independent chapters opposed it. And so three chapters have separated from the national organization to date, and I suspect there's going to be more. Um, right now, 40% of donations go to the national organization. Um, and I think there's a real move afoot to make sure that 
money that's raised in local communities stays in local communities. Still, there is a lot of history here. You said it wasn't that difficult a decision to make. How long did it take to make the decision? What were the, the arguments pro and against? Well, our board had a number of deliberations on this issue over the last couple months. And what was most important, again, is how do we support local research? How do we back the community? And how do we honor the intent of our donors when they give us donations? And so when we looked at all of those things, it wasn't consolidating with Chicago and dissolving our local board of directors and allowing all of the assets that were raised here in San Diego to go to Chicago. Did you get pushback from Chicago? Well, the, the headquarters of the National Alzheimer's Association has certainly been encouraging chapters to consolidate within them, um, but it's a local decision. So what does the change mean for the services that you provide to people with Alzheimer's? Well, Alzheimer's San Diego is up and running. We have a new website. Our team is helping and serving people as we speak. Um, all of our programs are in place. We're actually adding some additional programs. Um, so I think this is going to allow us to expand what we do in the community because if we can keep 40% more of dollars here in San Diego, we're going to be able to do more. So it's actually a positive for the local chapter, um, which is now an independent ind uh, entity. But what are some of the new services that you're offering patients? Well, we have a volunteer respite program. It's called All's Companions. And that's where we train volunteers, pair them with families so caregivers can get a break and that's what many of them need the most. That's a program we're going to continue to build on and expand on. Um, under, when we were under the national organization, we were very limited in how we could support local research. And so we've developed a consortium of all the prestigious research institutes here in San Diego, and we are going to be doing a lot more support of local research, fundraising, helping getting people into clinical trials. So those are just two of the areas that we're going to be really be able to grow locally. Mary Ball, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thank you. Carlsbad voters may be more focused on the holidays than on February's special election measure A, but Caruso Affiliated, the developer who wants to build a shopping center next to a Carlsbad lagoon, has set up an information tent for people who have questions about that project. The site next to Interstate 5 near the strawberry fields. The special election is set for February 23rd. San Diego leaders calling for a state of emergency because of El Nino fueled storms. The idea is to suspend environmental regulations so storm preparations can be fast tracked. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen explains, however, uh, what could happen next. When the city of San Diego talks about El Nino preparations, this is what it looks like. Messy business, but from the city's point of view, necessary to protect people's homes and lives. The city says getting the permits to clear storm channels can take up to two years. It's part of a careful environmental review that San Diego, the county, and the region's 17 other cities want to put on hold. Pollutants associated with that can be metal. Borak with the Coast Law Group is skeptical, especially when it comes to the city of San Diego. She says San Diego doesn't have a good track record when it comes to respecting the environment and should have done these flood preparations years ago. I think it's more a priority issue and um, a timing issue that the city hasn't been keeping up with its infrastructure needs. And using a state of emergency is a really easy way to get out of doing the environmental review that we realize is costly and time consuming, but is really important. Important because while these plants may be, well, ugly, they're a natural filtration system. When it rains, a bunch of nasty pollutants get washed into storm channels, rivers, and streams. The plants filter those pollutants out before they reach the ocean, making the water on our beaches cleaner. Clearing out plants and sediment could make ocean water more toxic, and it could destroy habitat for wildlife. 
We certainly understand the risk to life and to property that flooding poses, but we're a little suspicious that they're trying to do all of these channels right now on an emergency basis when it's not something that happened overnight. They knew these channels needed to be cleared for, for almost a decade. Houseware type electronics. And Stephen Vincent owns a business next to a storm channel in Kearney Mesa. He says the building's management has tried to get the city to clean out the channel for years without success. I don't understand why they can't just keep them cleaned out every couple of years instead of letting it grow up for years and becoming a real clogged, bad situation. The city says it doesn't do that because it has 84 miles of storm channels to manage and maintain, all with limited resources. But before that, we have to get all of our permits lined up. Chris McFadden is the head of San Diego's stormwater department. He says the city needs permission from up to six government agencies to work in storm channels. Because of the endangered birds in these areas, we can only clean the channels during the rainy season. So that's a challenge too. It's it, when those regulations came into effect, that actually reduced the ability for us to clean channels by 50%. McFadden says even with the state of emergency declaration, the city would still have to assess the environmental impact of its work and find ways to make up for any damage it may do. All those efforts would just wait until after the work is done. Every time we do a channel clearing, we put it out for public notice and public review to get any input to make sure that we've crossed every T and dotted every I. So actually, I think this is probably the most robust and most environmentally sensitive channel clearing that I'm familiar with. Environmentalists say the review can't possibly be as strong if it's done after the fact. But they do agree with the city on one thing. San Diego has to protect people's lives and property. The governor's office is still considering the request for a state of emergency. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. KPBS video journalist Katie Shuloff helped produce that story. Working for justice for those in need, a San Diego legal program is marking a major milestone this year. Amitha Sharma has more on the legal experts who are providing a much needed service for free. Going to see a lawyer is usually not doable for the poor. California Western School of Law's Community Law Project has worked to change that. The project is celebrating its 10th anniversary, providing free legal services in five clinics in San Diego County. Joining me now are the project's executive director, Dana Susitsky, and third-year law student and project volunteer, Marisa Lockhart. Dana, let's start with you. Sure. How badly are these clinics needed out there in the community? You know, they're so needed. Um, as you said, Amitha, um, for a low-income person, for somebody who's undocumented, um, there's just not very many resources. Um, you know, in addition to the the funding issue, you know, people don't have the money to spend on an attorney. Um, it's just not doable transportation-wise, um, et cetera. We really try to put our clinics in places where clients are already going to be. Um, we're in schools, we're in churches that offer meals to the homeless. Um, the idea is, our, our motto is actually we meet people where they are. Um, and our, our goal is to really have clients come into a place they were already going to go anyway, and then we're there to assist. So Marisa, who comes to these clinics and what are their legal problems? Well, we welcome everybody to come in the door. So uh, most of the clients are lower income. Um, we have a lot of undocumented people who come in as well, but we really we don't turn anybody away. So whatever your problem is, we'll help you. I mean, we I've seen clients uh, with family law problems, criminal law problems, housing problems, employment problems, bankruptcy, public benefits. I mean, really, any legal field <laughs> is involved. So, so what do you do for them? Do you go to court with them? Do you file motions? What do you do? Um, so we don't actually represent any clients from the clinic. Uh, we are mostly just a referral service in which we help clients pretty much lead them in the right direction. So maybe they need an attorney and we'll help them find a pro bono attorney or a reduced fee attorney, or maybe they need the assistance of a nonprofit organization. And so we will refer them to that organization and lead them in the right direction so that they have a better understanding of what their rights are and what they can do to fix their problem. So Dana, I'm guessing that these clinics are pretty popular, are more needed. Um, you know, 
Certainly, I think, you know, right now we have limited hours at all of our sites, um, and all of our sites are really busy. So I think our first step would be to increase the hours um, at the sites we're already located at. But we've certainly had requests from um, other locations to put clinics there. So yes, I would say, you know, they're very needed in other places. Um, we also try to do a lot of community education presentations, and we do these um, in different locations as well. So we certainly have them at our five sites, but we also have them at additional locations to try to you know spread the wealth amongst other areas of San Diego. And how easy or difficult is it to get students from the law school to volunteer? Um, it's a very popular program at California Western. It's one of several um, clinics that are offered there through the experiential learning program. Um, and you know we always get more students applying for the program than um, we can accept. So I mean we're lucky in that regard and you know hopefully we're able to serve as many students um, as we can in addition to the clients we see. And Marisa, I'm guessing it's not just the poor who go to these clinics who actually benefit, it's the students as well. What has your experience been like? It's nothing, it, it's not like anything I've ever done before. Um, just the feeling that you get when you can actually sit down with a client and the relief that they feel when you just listen to their story. I mean, sometimes a lot of these people are just disregarded. People don't believe they have a claim or they just don't want to take the time to listen to what they have to say. And so actually sitting down with a client and listening to them and being able to parse out the relevant and important facts in their story has really taught me a lot and is a skill that I know that I'll be able to use later on in my legal career. So Dana, is the hope ultimately that more graduating law students will go into public interest law, will do this kind of work, or if they go work for a large law firm, they might do a little bit more pro bono work? What's the hope? Certainly. I mean, our, our goals are twofold. Our mission is twofold. One, you know, very client-based, but also the students. Um, we're hoping to, you know, give the students a little taste of what it's like to work with these populations in the hope that they will take that ball and um, run with it when they graduate, whether they go into public service um, as a primary field or whether or not they go into private practice. Um, our hope is that they'll continue doing pro bono work. Um, and we're always looking for volunteer attorneys to help us at our clinics sort of continue that mission. And very quickly, Marisa, is that your plan? Do you think you'll pursue this a little bit more? Yes, I certainly hope so. So, I mean, granted, I pass the bar next year. <laughs> you will. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, I, I definitely intend to come back as an attorney and help out when I can. Okay, Marisa, Dana, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thank, thank you. you so much. I'm Judy Woodruff. On the next News Hour, we sit down with famed director Spike Lee about his new movie, Chirac. That's Friday on the PBS News Hour. Well, music lost a magnetic rock star. Scott Weiland, the former frontman of the Stone Temple Pilots and Velvet Revolver, died yesterday. He died on his tour bus before a show while on tour with his latest band, The Wildabouts. Authorities say they found a small quantity of cocaine on the bus, and police arrested a California man traveling with Weiland. Weiland was 48 years old. The countdown is on to drones and lightsabers, 14 days away from the new Star Wars movie. With fan excitement peaking, San Diego's IDW Publishing thought it was a perfect opportunity to showcase a special exhibit at Liberty Station. KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando takes us on a trip to a galaxy far, far away. You may not realize this, but in April of 1977, a galaxy far, far away came to vivid life in a comic book weeks before the Star Wars movie hit the screen. You're all clear, kid. Now let's go home. Original art from Marvel's comic book adaptation of George Lucas's film are now on display at IDW's Comic Art Gallery in Liberty Station. Scott Doonbeer says the gallery is devoted to showcasing comic book art. Uh, currently, we are showing a unique exhibit of Star Wars original artwork from the very first comic book series that Marvel Comics published in 1977. It was an adaptation of the first film by a gentleman named Roy Thomas and Howard Chaikin. And we have about 30 pieces of art, all from the original comics. IDW, which runs the gallery, is the fourth largest comic book publisher in the country. One of its specialties is publishing a series of books it calls Artist Editions. The one for Star Wars complements the exhibit. So, so there are approximately 140 pages of 
original art that had been scanned for the Star Wars book. Uh, and since we have the art gallery, it made perfect sense to have an art exhibit. Any artwork, being able to see it in person is a completely different experience than it is to see it printed. Comic art is done in black and white, it's done larger. To actually be able to see what the artist did, and not just the, the penciler and the inker, but also the letterer, the production people. You know, you can see uh, editorial notations. You can get a real feel of how something is done. You can see all the, all the nuances that make original art unique. The gallery draws a diverse crowd and provides inspiration. We have a drawing table set up here that has a sketchbook that kids can come in and draw on them. Star Wars has expanded its appeal over the past 38 years. Dunebeer says that's because it tells a classic tale of adventure. You have characters that are noble, that give their lives, that inspire. It's, it's great tragedy, great romance. It's a movie and a series of hope. And I think that that resonates with people. For further proof, just look to the interest the new sequel, The Force Awakens, is stirring. With more than $50 million in ticket pre-sales and two weeks to go until the film's December 18th opening. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. Well, the force definitely strong with this one. The Art of Marvel Star Wars runs through January 31st, and the Comic Art Gallery is open Wednesday through Saturday. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening, edition, uh, evening edition. Thanks very much for joining us. We will be back here on Monday, so have yourself a great weekend.